Lord, Heavenly Father, give you thanks that we meet together. Thank you, Lord, for praise and worship tunes, even if they come via mobile phones. Lord, just give you thanks that we can meet, go through your word together, spend time in your presence together, listening to you speaking to us together. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, good morning to you goldfish. I'm not a goldfish. <laughs> well, there is a view that we're all goldfish. Do you know why? Well, a goldfish, if they're in their bowl, they just swim and swim around in their bowl. Yeah? They know nothing but inside their bowl. They might see out, but it's very blurred, and they actually can't see beyond just literally the rim of their bowl. So they only know their own swimming environment. They only know that to which they are swimming in. That's why I called you goldfish, because that emphasizes in the home. We live, funny enough, in goldfish bowls because we only know, after time, our own culture. You actually do not identify your own culture very well. The way you've been brought up, the way you've grown and the way you live, you might notice that some of it is actually your cultural upbringing. A goldfish doesn't know anything outside of its bowl until somebody tells it to it. Tips it out of the bowl. Into a river, Dorothy. Absolutely. And then he starts seeing so much more. And then might realise how his own bowl has been incredibly restrictive. And imposed on him his world view that actually is not a right world view. All of us swim in our own culture. And it influences the way we read God's word, and it influences the way we live our Christian lives. My culture is, I like my coffee, bear with me. So today is about looking at sort of one element, our culture, and unpacking it a little bit. Our culture being, we all come from different cultures, so you're going to have to pick up your own culture. I can't identify every single one of us in this room. And funny enough, you could come from the same country, but your culture could be very much different. If I can talk about the UK, I could say that actually West London has a very different culture from East London. There's quite distinct differences, even in the way they speak. There is distinct differences. Clearly, the West London has the proper way, clearly. Yes. Clearly, just thought we'd throw that in there. So I want to turn, I would love to, it went again, so we are getting a new, what's it? We'll discuss the semantics of it on Tuesday. But could you read Acts 13 if you're able to pull it up on your phone? Acts 13 verses 4 to 12. And I shall read to you Acts 13, 4 to 12. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia 
and there sailed for the island of Cyprus. It's funny, isn't it, actually? Andy Robertson's gone to Cyprus this morning to go and spend time with Martin. I thought it was quite funny. Anyway, there in the town of uh, Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. By the way, John Mark is the same John Mark as the Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Afterward, they travelled from town to town across the entire island until finally they reached Pathos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Polus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of the Lord. But Elamus, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good. Will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. When the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. Come back to what I said last week. If you don't think that God still judges people today, read Acts. And actually, that's part of the extension of today's teaching. So we've got Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. Cyprus, preaching the word of God in the synagogues. Then we jump straight to a tale of the Roman governor of Pathos, Sergius Pullus, who I seem to keep naming in my head as Serge. And I think it's got something to do with Beverly Hills Cop. (laughs) My name's Serge. Would you like a little lemon twist? Anyway, if you don't know what I'm talking about, watch Beverly Hills Cop. A man, according to Luke, according to Luke, who wrote Acts, is uh, Sergius Pallas was an intelligent man. He's Gentile, Roman governor, and he obviously heard Paul reports of Paul and Barnabas and wanted to hear the news for himself. And he was an intelligent man, so he sends for them. I want to hang on to the fact, if you've noticed, that Sergius was an intelligent man. It's clearly evident in Acts, he was an intelligent man. It's very easy for us today to look at the Roman governors from our movie portrayals of them. Like, for instance, something like, say, from The Life of Brian. Anybody knows Monty Python's Life of Brian? Am I calling blasphemy here by mentioning that movie in this church? To be so easy to make them look, even the movies about Jesus, when you look at the Romans in that, it's very easy to pick up and assume that they were actually stupid, greedy men. I was going to show you a clip from the life of Brian, but I thought some of you may not get it. So, self-centred and totally unaware, that's how we can get them, but actually it couldn't be further from the truth. You could not be a governor of a province in Rome if you weren't intelligent. You might have been intelligent, a little bit wily, know how to do politics, know how to get into positions of power. Very, very clever person. So I want to take that moment and appreciate that Sergius Pullus was actually an intelligent man. Did you know that he, as the governor and the province of Cyprus, he had complete judicial control of the entire region? He made the rules. He had a lot of power. An intelligent man. So he calls for Paul and Barnabas. And on their way there, they, while they're in that court, encounter a Jewish sorcerer called Bar-Jesus, By the way, Bar Jesus means son of, as in son of Jesus, not literally biological son of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was actually quite a common name, derived from Joshua, so it could mean son of Joshua. 
So let's just make that clear before we start worrying. It's like my surname, McNeil. The Muk bit actually means son of, as in son of Neil. Now, yes, my dad is not called Neil. But our descendants would go from originally back to somebody called Neil at some point or some version of that. Do you understand the... So, meets this Jewish sorcerer called Bar-Jesus, who somehow had attached himself, got into the central uh, place of actually this incredibly intelligent Roman governor. So try and imagine the, the court, you know, the, the place where the Roman governor is within his courtroom where things took place, where people came and met with him and he had his advisors, etc. An intelligent man and he has a Jewish sorcerer as part and parcel of his sort of entourage. You've got that? What's the best way to look at it? Um, not quite the same, but close enough. Uh, Prime Minister and the Cabinet. Okay. I'm the Prime Minister. I know he doesn't have total judicial control, if you know what I mean. Still, we live in a democratic society. Um, but, you know, that sort of imagery, you've got that. And he's got his advisors all around him. And by the way, before we continue, when we mean sorcerer, we literally mean sorcery. We do mean magic. We mean things like rituals, invocations, amulets being worn, that sort of stuff. Real, strong, spiritual magic. Not your nice illusionary. And oh, a card has just appeared in my hand. Bunch of flowers. We're not talking that sort of magic. We're talking real magic, evil magic. Magic, it was practiced to control the deities and the spirits of the cosmos. Magic that was used for self-serving gain. Magic used to influence a deity, small d. Never to do a deity's will. Never to do a god's will. They used magic never to do what they thought ever god they were worshipping, to do that god's will. They used it to control that god, to get that god to do things for them. Curse that individual over there. And people wore the amulets to sort of stop any curses coming their way, some source of protection. What's the closest we might have in superstition? Rabbit's foots. Yeah? A uh, lucky piece of coal. It's a piece of coal. Horseshoes. Oh, if I touch me horseshoe on the way out, I'll have good luck all day. They go on the feet of horses. Can anybody think of anybody, any other magical things? Just holler it out at a moment. Yeah, I agree with you, Carol. Crosses. Use them sometimes in that way. Lucky yeah, lucky charm, source of protection. That, oh, if I've got that. See, it's swinging in the cars at some people, and you just think... <coughs> and then when they've just abused me because of my bad driving, I'm like, uh-huh. No, because what am I saying? I don't bad drive. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> huh? Red chilies. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Hindu, Hindu homes. Hindu homes. They put a kind of garland of red chilies at the door to ward off evil spirits. Okay, thank you. So a garland of red chilies across the front door? Yes. Yeah, front door to ward off evil spirits within the Hindu faith. There you go, that's one thing. We will not talk about my driving, Ola. <laughs> yes. Ola saw me once. Yes. Where? Gurnell Swimming Pool. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> driving at all speed? No, I was not driving out at speed. <laughs> it's a long story, long debate. Oh, <sighs> <laughs> Moving on. I won't bother going home this afternoon. Right. But do you see what I mean? So you can think of those things. Anybody else? Can anybody else just... just I'm deliberately not shoving the mic in people's faces. I think people... Crossing fingers, touching wood. Absolutely. Crossing fingers, touching wood. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, Andy, couldn't resist. <laughs> I'm joking, clearly. But it's true. I do see people doing this. Yes. <laughs> Garlic. Yeah, ward off vampires for a starter is one thing. Is That's how it's got turned into in the modern movies. But right, garlic to ward off evil spirits. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry? That's very 
salt. Throwing salt, yeah, yeah, pinch of salt will do. Uh, St. Christopher's, a lot of lorry drivers wear St. Christopher's. Ah, St. Christopher's, yes, that's correct, wearing the thing of St. Christopher because he's the uh, patron saint of travellers, isn't he? Yeah, and they use that as more of a lucky charm than actually believing in any of it. Count to ten. Count to ten? No, I just count to ten just to stop me getting angry. <laughs> Times I'm far too honest in this church, I think. No, I'm joking. So, those are those things, but actually there is a power behind them. Because we might laugh about them today a little bit, but there is a genuine power of spirit, of fear, that is behind them. Why do you do it? Because you're fearing something. You're fearing pain, aren't you? You're fearing any catastrophe coming at you. So there is actually a real magical spirit behind it, an evil spirit behind it. And notice that everybody, every example you've come out with is about influencing the deity or the saint or whatever you're following. It's got nothing to do with doing what that deity or saint wants you to do. Now hear me carefully, I am not saying... I'm just trying to use the thinking that goes on in people's heads. We will clearly say we're here to do God's will. Amen? Amen. Right, okay. And we would say there is no other God other than God. Yeah? Okay, so when I'm saying God, I'm saying small g. People's concepts of their gods and their deities and their saints. And so they, we hold on to those things because we... Or, sorry, people hang on to those things because they actually are fearing something. And therefore, they hopefully this thing will protect them. And when we think about it for ourselves for a minute, where is it that maybe we've got something we don't want to throw out the house? Because it's always been there. It originally had some sort of charm type meaning behind it. And you know now that you love Christ wholeheartedly and God is your only saviour and trust. But you, you, you struggle to maybe throw that thing out because you think, just in case, it's the wrong thing to have done. I, I'll, I'll invoke trouble my way. Now you might be sitting there going, oh no, no, no. But that does go under people's heads. I, I know somebody who um, kept a lucky piece of coal, full-on Christian, discovered it and went, What's that there for? Oh, that's the lucky piece of coal. <laughs> now, now, now you laugh, but bear with me. But that's what happens. Because it sat there for years, and they've never sort of thought about it. They have continued to swim in their goldfish bowl and not noticed it, not tweet that actually, as those words left their mouths, what they're actually saying. It got thrown. So I'm just picking that up. So just think for yourself for a minute. What is it in your house that you might have around that you've not really thought about particularly, but you've just always just kept it there because, I don't know, it's nice or whatever. You've never really thought, actually, you treat it almost like a lucky charm. It could be a cross. And we're going to carry on with our culture. So, these deities. What's interesting, by the way, in the Roman Empire, magic was illegal. In Judaism, the use of magic was strictly forbidden. Yet here we have, in 1 AD, a Jewish sorcerer. Sounds like a weird combination, doesn't it? Just going to turn to a couple of chapters. Deuteronomy 18. I'm literally going to read some verses. You're more than welcome to join me. Deuteronomy 18 10. Is anybody getting hot or is it just me? It's getting hot. Joy, could you just hit the. Thanks. That's it. Done. No, no, it's fine. Once that boost button, the temperature outside will make us drop. Because obviously I don't want you falling asleep because it's nice and warm. 18 10. 
For instance, um, when you enter the land that the Lord has given you, be very careful not to imitate the detest detestable customs of the nations living there. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. And do not let your people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. It's fairly clear cut, isn't it? So yet here we have in 1 AD a Jewish sorcerer. Interesting, most of the pagan religions sort of rode on some element of magic. So we've got a right little mix here, haven't we? We've got a Roman governor who's the rules from his on high is you don't use magic, it's forbidden. You've got supposedly somebody part of the Jewish tribe who practices magic, mixed together in Cyprus on this island. Amazing why that's probably spiritual warfare so much in Cyprus, isn't there, today? Why are they there? Well, they've assimilated assimilated the different nations and the cultural activity around them. And that it's allowed to slowly seep into their thinking, into their culture, into their religious practices. Especially for the Jew, he shouldn't be practicing this at all. It's very clear cut in the Bible there, isn't it? Just don't do it. But somehow he's assimilated, and try and get yourself into this imagination, he's somehow assimilated the culture around him, not really thought about it, picked it up as a good job, because I think he's getting paid for this as well, picked it up as a good job and taken it on board and gone, this is okay. Even though in his own religious book, the old, what we call the Old Testament, in the Torah, there is a clear directive from God saying no. Yet he's practicing it. Living in his goldfish bowl culture. Can that happen to us? Does that happen to us? There are things in our culture that we take on board, we soak up, and somehow we practice it. Even though there is more than likely clear directive in the Bible, no. to Serge or Sir Gius and Bar Jesus, this false prophet. I want you to imagine in that, that room at the moment, there is Sir Gius, the Roman governor, control of all he surveys. He has Paul and Barnabas in, come to talk about Jesus. And then he has this Jewish sorcerer to one side. I want you, can you imagine that, how that scene must look? How that conversation must go? Could you just imagine that? Because he's trying to distract him, isn't he? He doesn't want him to believe at all. The sorcerer was trying to keep the governor from believing. Now, we're going to try and imagine that if you can. Um, so I need, uh, I need a Paul, which I've already arranged. His name's called Steve. This is biblically confusing. We're going to try and, we've not practiced this, I hasten to add, so this is going to be fun. I need a Serge. Can I have a Sergius, please? Can I have a Roman governor? All you've got to do is stand here. Don't panic. You haven't got to do anything else. Can I have a Roman governor? I'm going to pick on someone. Well done, Timmy. Who else do we need? Huh? That's it. I'm going to be the Jewish sorcerer. <laughs> Thank you. So kind. Do you want to borrow my glasses? <laughs> so we're going to try and do this. So imagine, here is Timmy, the Roman, who's got to stand up on the stage, by the way. 
He's the Roman governor. He's in charge. We're in his courtroom. He's allowed us to come in here. So Paul is now going to portray the gospel to him. What's his name again? Serge. Just call him Serge for now. It makes life easier. Use Serge. the microphone. Serge. Lord. Lord Serge. Is this on? <laughs> I've got a big mouth anyway, but is this on? Lord Serge. I'm Paul. I'm a Jew, a follower of Jesus. I want to tell you about what Jesus has done for me. My liege. I also am Jewish and clearly come from the same religion he's done. As he speaks, I wish to be able to speak to you from what I believe as well. I rebuke you. I know where you've come from. I know about who you believe in. I know the things you believe in aren't what God believes in. And I want to tell you this, okay? I'm going to curse you now in Jesus' name that you'll be blind. Okay, that's not how I wanted it to happen. <laughs> I'm an evangelist. I'll just get go to the point. <laughs> I want you to carry on evangelising with him. Yes. Now, now I've sorted him out. Let me tell you about Jesus. Well, thank you very much, Timmy, very much for a fine acting by Timmy. Thank you. Next time we'll practice that. <laughs> Can everybody rebuke the curse that's upon my life now, please? Thank you very much. Unbelievable. I'll take it back. <laughs> you phone somebody in the week and say, this is what I want to happen. Well, you have dialogue with me, isn't it? Oh, okay. Well, where was the dialogue? That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do it again. No. <laughs> the way I wanted that to look, bless Steve. Sorry. So the problem is, is with Steve, you've got to think about it, he does get to the point. Yeah. I remember the time that we walked in together into uh, in a fish and chip shop, and he literally said to the bloke, do you know Jesus? The bloke went, no. He said, why not? <laughs> to the point. But listen, that's how people come to know Jesus, by some people's standards. So I'm not knocking Steve at all for that. But what I wanted to show was... The point was, at that moment, you think there is a Jew this side, at least they've got, there's a Jew this side, as far as Serge is concerned, Sergius is concerned, sorry, I keep calling him Serge, Sergius is concerned, there is two Jews either side of him, coming with two different opinions. Yes? And of course, one he's going to trust a lot more than the other. Because one has been in his court all the time, has been the voice that's been talking to him all the time. So you had that battle, and there would have been sort of Steve giving the right sort of evangelistic talk, and me giving the opposite argument, and talking about from our culture, ah, but yeah, but we don't do that here. We have all these other gods, don't forget. And don't forget, I'm a Jew as well. Do you see the point? It's very easy to pick up within our culture and with our own goldfish bowl and what we understand. And clearly it needed direct power from God to actually make Sergius um, see, strangely enough, make the sorcerer blind, but it allows the governor to see and commit his life. But I don't want to keep talking about them. I'm using them as an example of how deceit, how the twisting of truth can come from someone who, as I said, is in the same boat as Paul. And our own culture can dis twist the truth. So Jesus said was an intelligent man. He would have been thoughtful about this stuff, processing of it all. I think sometimes we can be so intelligent and such deep thinkers that we overthink stuff. And it can twist the truth that's in the Bible. Our cultural normality can be a great deceiver. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Verse 15 to 20.
And remember, the sorcerer was a false prophet. And it states here from Jesus' very own words, Beware of false prophets who've come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Beware of false prophets. Ones who come into the church, which this eventually will turn into talking about. Those who are actively setting out to deceive and be destructive. Wolves among sheep are nothing but destructive. Here the deceivers sound and look like genuine prophets. As France states, this metaphor can also be used for false teachers in the early church, as in Acts 20, 29, when Paul says, I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. False teachers can come into churches, not caring about the people of the church. Even some men or women within your own congregation could rise up and distort the truth. Because they want to get people to follow their own agenda. How does false prophet and our own culture blend? We will see as we go. Deceit and false teaching can get into a church. We talk about from Ephesians 6, be on our guard, do we not? We sometimes see that as just against false spirits, but actually we need to be on our guard about the teaching that comes our way. You have to be on your guard about the teaching that comes out of my mouth. You should test it all the time. Read the Bible, double check, make sure I'm not deceiving you intentionally or unintentionally. So, false teachers can get in. Now, we're hopefully, well, I know we don't do false teaching here. Um, we try and do it fairly straight down the line, good old evangelical teaching. But we do that quite well here because we've got guards in place. Sometimes it'd be nice to quite literally have them in place, you know, swords drawn. Um, but uh, we, we do have people in things in place to hopefully protect against false teaching coming in. Unfortunately, we live in a modern age. So where else can false teaching get a foothold in the church? Real question. How can false teaching get into the church? Where's that? Christian, so-called Christian TV. Oh, so-called Christian TV. So-called Christian TV. Anything else? Internet. Internet. Absolutely, internet. Not reading the correct Bible. Not reading the correct Bible. Could you explain that to me, Dennis? What's not the correct Bible? Well, not uh, reading the, the, the true word of God. Is that... Okay, what's not... <laughs> Who's got a Bible? Hold it aloft. See, we got it on phones, we got it in books. They're all Bibles. What do you mean by not the true Bible? Are you talking about one that maybe come from a... a, a from a... From a different one that purports to be Christian yeah. but isn't. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Steve. Friends and family. Friends and family from other churches or, 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 other, or Christians. Friends or family from other churches. Yeah, this really isn't working, is it, Rose? Busted, isn't it? It's not your fault. No, it is on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, something's not Friends right with it. Not to worry. But, but uh, of, of who are telling you things, how they see it. 
Okay, people are saying how they see it, but actually we would say that is not doctrinally true. Okay. Radio. Oh, Carly. Could be books and stuff that people read, and then their interpretation of that. Yes. Coming in. Yep. Answer. Books, stuff that we can read, and it's it's the author's interpretation, and we can pick up from that and take it in. Just because something is on the Christian channel, or it's a Christian YouTuber, or it's a pastor, doesn't mean. What they're teaching is right. I have to make this very clear. It's so easy for us to pick this stuff up. I'm amazed the stuff. I get free stuff sent to me on my desk um, all the time via the post. And I read some of it. I think, really? Do people believe this junk? Yes, they do. People who I believe are spirit-filled Christians might read that and go, yeah, I believe that. That's exactly what's going to happen. Or that's how it's going to pan out. Because my culture has informed me of this. And let me explain to you how our culture informs us. Rapture. Who's looking forward to the rapture? You're all going to be a bit dodgy now, aren't you? You're going to be wondering about this, yeah? yeah? Okay, so you're all looking forward to being raised up into the air when Jesus comes, Yes. And being removed from the pain of the tribulation, yes? Where does that say that in the Bible? Let me explain to you something about the rapture theology. The, the great rapture theology that we Christians will be completely swept up. And there will be, we will not get caught up in all the earthquakes. We will not get caught up in any of the... the, the supposedly revelation army coming surging down... Do you know where that, if you all understand anything to do with rapture, there is this concept of you, us all being raised up into the air? Yeah? Uh, there's bumper stickers in, in American cars that state, should this car suddenly be, uh, be warned, at rapture time, this car will, be, this dri this car will become driverless. This con yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this concept that we're going to get whipped away out of the blue, and it's all going to be nice and clear. We Christians are not going to suffer. And it's taken out of two places. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, which says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, and the voice of the archangel with the trumpet call of God. First the Christians who have died will raise from the grave. First the Christians who died will raise from the grave. Amen. amen. Sorry, you can say amen to this. This is true. Amen but not how it's been interpreted subsequently. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then we'll be with the Lord forever. And Matthew 24, 30, uh, Matthew 24, verses 37 to 40. And we'll get there in a minute. I'll get there in a minute. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realise what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. And this is where it gets twisted. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. And we all go, yes. But you combine that concept of we'll be swept up into the air when Jesus comes, which is the way it's taken. But that one Thessalonians was about a king. In their time, when a king was coming into his town... His people would go rushing out to meet him with a parade of, our king is coming, and then come with the king back into the town. Okay? And that's that same image. Because where is God's kingdom? Imagery up there. 
But actually, when he comes, it's a new heaven and a new earth. It's to reside here. So that concept of us being swept up into the air is we're going out to meet our king, the God, God, and come down with him and join him back on the earth and then judge the people and whatever else. And where it's been misinterpreted then using Matthew is that whole bit that one will, two people will be gr grinding. One will be left and one will be taken away. You've got to separate the two passages because the one taken away is taken away in the flood. Because in that Matthew passage, it talks about in the days of Noah. So the person taken away isn't taken away up into the air. They are swept away in a flood of judgment. The one left is the one who's all right. Do you see the point? And the reason that's there, and we've interpreted that within the culture, is because we believe in the West that we should avoid all pain as followers of Christ. We live in a hedonistic lifestyle. Everything is about being happy. What's that song? I wanna, if you're, no. We played it yesterday. What was it? Yeah. Pharrell Williams, isn't it? Yeah. That song. That's actually how lifestyle is about pursuing happiness. Look at your adverts. It's about you pursuing happiness. When Jesus said, I've come to give life, life in all its fullness and abundance, he didn't say, so you could sit on the cloud of happiness for the rest of your life. And so this idea of this being swept up is our culture saying we should suffer no pain. And we interpret that within our Christian walkers. If I follow Jesus, I should suffer no pain. So then we struggle when pain comes our way. That's because our culture influences the way we think about our Christian walk. Do you see the point? So we have to be careful. And there's so much I also I could say about how the West has influenced. And, and, and even if you're not from the West, if you're originally from another country that's not part of Western Europe, believe you me, if you've lived here long enough, your brain has been influenced by the adverts that are around here. And it is TV, it is radio, it is books, it is the internet. False teachers come through that stuff. And it comes through the advertising world as well. So how do we combat false teaching, false prophets? How do we combat the falseness that can go in on our head? How do we go against that? I'll try, we'll try it. One, two, one. Oh. Sorry, I need to get to Carol. So we need to really know um, God's word and um, like there's a, a, a scripture, you might tell me, that says, see, I set a, a plumb line. So like a plumb line is what, say, a decorator or just let's say a decorator. He will hang um, a piece of string with a weight on from the top to the bottom and that will be a dead straight line because the, the weight makes it dead straight and you measure everything from that. Mm -hmm. So that's why we really need to know God's word, otherwise we can be deceived. True, but also by the example I've just given, we can interpret, sorry, we can interpret God's word differently from somebody else next to us. Just to, so what, what else, how else? Oh, sorry. Um, I can't remember where this, quotation is from in, uh, in the Bible it says something like around the line that um, those that know their Lord shall be strong and they shall do exploits and that is just the baseline for me as Carol said that we need to know the Lord, we need to know the word and we can only know that if we are not just reading the Bible but engaging, there's a massive difference between reading something and actually engaging yeah. with it engaging with the Bible engaging with the Lord, with the God that we serve, we need to be 
um, to have a strong partnership, a strong on the, the 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 closer we are with God, the more we know Him, the the more engaged we are with Him, the more He talks to us, the more we listen to Him, the more we learn from Him, and I can go on and on and on. Where do you want me to stop? No, okay, <laughs> I'll stop you then, Ola. Thank you. Can you all hear that? By the way, I'm not sure. If... Steve, let's do it this way. Uh, I mean, two things. James chapter one talks about. Um, knowing the word of God, but secondly, accountability, having people around you who are, you know, who, who believe the same as, as you, and you're able to, able to talk to each other about stuff as well. Okay. Well, uh, um, something similar to what Steve is saying. Um, I think um, you need to find yourself in an environment um, where you trust people, you know, mm -hmm. you look for people that you trust and um, see what their, you know, their outlook is on, you know, on a particular situation from a biblical point of view, you know, because you probably might not be as knowledgeable as probably they are. So, um, you know, that's what I'll do. Thank you. Yeah, that for me is the, one of the key things is we can, we can actually study the Bible on our own. We can really dip into it, dip into it, be in our great relationship with the Lord. But we, none of us, ever, 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 ever come to the Bible neutral. We never come to the Bible culturally free. We'll all read the Word of God at some point with our own cultural eyes. It's quite well known and normal. I could easily justify to you from a western viewpoint why it's okay to pursue money. You can do that biblically quite easily. If you're one who wants to do that. But I would agree totally. Part of it is definitely studying the Bible. But it's being connected to church. It's one thing. That's why it says, do not give up meeting together. It's not just so we can all clap each other's hands and hug and love and sing songs together. It's actually so we can debate with each other. Willing to debate with those who are willing to challenge you in your thinking. Maybe doing it in house groups. There's one this Wednesday at 8 o'clock. Just thought I'd plug it. Seriously, doing it in house groups, discussing it, maybe being willing to go, do you know something? I'm not quite sure if in my little group we've quite got this right. I want to go and chat to the pastor. And this is key for me, willing to know that you might be mistaken in your interpretation, that openness of heart and mind that you might be wrong. You could have held on to a belief for so long that it becomes part of your interpretation of everything else and you could be wrong. I have got examples from me from way, way back when I first, not long into being a Christian. Not going to unpack them now because you'll just all laugh at me and be grateful I went to theology college. But the point is, we can look at things and we interpret them incorrectly and we have to be willing to be wrong and mistaken. And so then in our discussions and our batting around, we can discern what we're thinking. And we have to also know ourselves. It's useful to know ourselves. So we have to be careful. And we have to be careful to look and discern what is the teaching on around us, not just on Christian channels, but our culture around us. Remember the Jewish sorcerer and the Roman governor? They've assimilated their culture around them. That is interpreted how they function. We assimilate our culture around us by our TV adverts. Some TV adverts and movies make things look like the norm. Make it look like it's okay. New newspaper star signs. You see them all the time. Doesn't it look the norm? Oh, I just want to say, I don't believe in it, but I'll just read it just to see, just have a laugh at it. 
Just don't read it. You're all giggling because some of you have been there, yeah? Just don't read it. TV adverts can help bring normalisation to society about being happy. A number of years ago, society would not have said sex before marriage was a big no-no. But very quickly, that got changed and turned. That normally was done by mass media, making it look the norm. So then it became acceptable. Don't see that in the Bible. Getting drunk these days. Ah, just a bit of binge drinking, it's all right. In it, and we see it on the news, and we talk about it. It's not good for their liver and all that sort of thing. But you see it on TV and movies and adverts, and it was even in actually um, uh, 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 Thor, uh, one of the movies, Thor, where one of them they got drunk on a good night out. And I got to say, I've sat there and thought, that's all right, that's a good laugh. But when you think about it, it was seen as okay to get absolutely bladdered, for want of a better phrasing. Sorry, that's a term of phrase for getting drunk. If you don't know, but it's seen as normal. But it's not. It shouldn't be. Little white lies. Not normal. Unless, of course, you're throwing a surprise birthday party for someone. That's different. That's not a subtle hint or anything. Gossip. Seen as normal in humour. All these things we seem to think as normal, but actually they're not. They go against what God wants, and we need to learn to discern what is going on around us. I've noticed that uh, uh, TV adverts now, uh, one for a bank and uh, another one for a love match, uh, uh, dot com society, now just seems to be throwing in uh, same-sex marriages as normal. If you watch it, he said yes. But only less than 2% of population described themselves as say sex orientated. I'm just using that just to point out how easy it becomes. I'm sure when there was sex before marriage, people living together, there was only a small percentage that were doing it. Yet it's become the norm and we don't even think about it. And the rules of our country have changed to adjust for sex before marriage for living together outside of marriage. I'm not being archaic in what I'm saying. I'm just trying to point out how easy it is we can become influenced and to think, and then we read that stuff back into the Bible. Did you know that your brain processes about 50,000 to 70,000 thoughts per day? Which is about 35 to 48 thoughts, conscious thoughts, per minute. It's amazing, isn't it? Your brain's amazing. It is just an amazing piece of computer technology. You're probably processing about one thought throughout the entire sermon right now, like, when is this over? <laughs> we assimilate images and adverts and writings unconsciously in ways you wouldn't even begin to believe. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, it says in the Bible. That means you need to constantly be making sure that you are not just assimilating the junk that is thrown at you from out there. We can become unconsciously deceived and assimilate our culture. So our false prophets don't just come in by people saying, I love Jesus. False prophets can come in via our culture and our adverts. Be on our guard. We must test everything. Everything we must test. Let's take a few moments just to rest with God just for a minute. Lord, Heavenly Father, recognise we live in a very complex society. We live in lots of ways, a very different society. Very fast, moving, image-driven, changing images, very fast image society. So different from 2,000 years ago in lots of ways. Yet also 
very similar. And Lord, I want to pray for all of us that actually we are people who are careful. We think about the things that we take on board. We look at how we're interpreting your word. Applying it to our lives, Lord. We make sure that we're living lives that you want us to, not as our culture tells us to. Lord, you ask us to be different. You ask us to be salt and light in your world. Sometimes that means we do have to be radically different in the way that we live our lives. And we may at times, Lord, have to disagree with those around us. Lord, I want to pray in the name of Jesus. We do it always in a spirit of loving the other person, be they followers of you or not followers of you. But Lord, help us to be people, to be watchful in the things that we learn. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.